All right, we're in Judges chapter 5, if you'd like to navigate on your device or open your Bible to Judges chapter 5. That's our text. We're going to look at all 31 verses. Judges chapter 5. The topic, Deborah and Barak sing a duet in which they praise Jael for driving a tent peg through Sisera's skull. The title of our message, I had a hammer and I hammered in the evening. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Word of God. It, it means so much to us to be able to have it in its fullness and to open it this morning and to study this portion which you have determined is for our learning. And I pray that we would meet you here in these verses, that we would know that Jesus has had a personal conversation with each one of us. Guide and direct and bless by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, Amen. It wasn't vintage at the time. It was my daily alarm clock when I was in high school. You can find it on eBay if you search for the vintage Batman and Robin talking alarm clock by Jan X. How many of you are familiar with this? Oh, good. One person, both services. <laughs> Pam bought one for me some years ago. It's in my office. It's a molded plastic scene of the dynamic duo running alongside the Batmobile. The clock portion of it was a wind-up, and then the alarm was a tape recording of the Cape Crusaders having a conversation. It doesn't work anymore because the technology is so old, but I remember the alarm. Jumping Jehoshaphat, Batman, we're needed again. That's right, Robin. We have to wake up our friends. Golly jeepers, Batman, I'll make the call. Okay, Robin, wake them all. Time to get up and out of bed. Good boy, Robin. Very well said. <laughs> it's nothing to plot. It was fantastic. It's a, it was, now it just goes... <laughs> Does anybody even know what tape is? You know what, what tape? Yeah. In hotels, have you ever been woken up at 3 a.m. by the previous guest because they set the alarm as a gag? Anybody had that experience? I say well played if you're not going to anticipate that and check the clock radio before you hit the sack. Now, I can't say that I've ever done that. It's certainly tempting. I, to me, that's the only reason the clock radio is in your room, since everybody has a cell phone or a Fitbit or something telling them what to do every five minutes, is to set it for the, preview, to, for the next subsequent tenant so that they will be angry in the middle of the night. Then there's the wake-up call. You arrange ahead of time for someone at the front desk to call you at a specified time. You don't need a someone anymore. If you have access to the Internet, wakeupdialer.com will make a wake-up call for you. By the way, I don't see why you couldn't enter anyone's phone number there as a gag, but you didn't hear that from me. All I'm saying is that tonight or this morning, if you get a call from San Diego, it might be wakeupdialer.com. Wake-up call has expanded to become an idiom in the English language that refers to warning someone that they need to deal with an urgent or dangerous problem and do something about it. In our verses in Judges chapter 5, we read that Deborah and Barak received spiritual wake-up calls. Verse 12 says, Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, and sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Obinoam. Deborah and Barak were awakened by the Lord to arise and take a stand against their enemies. As we read the first part of the chapter, we'll see an emphasis on them involving the larger congregation of Israel. Then as the chapter ends, the emphasis shifts to Jael, who received her own individual wake-up call and rose to the occasion. I'll organize my thoughts then around two points. Number one, as a congregation, we are called out to awake and arise. And number two, as a Christian, you are called upon to awake and arise. Let's take a look, first of all, at our congregation in the first 23 verses. My dad loved a good Western, or as he liked to call them, shoot 'em up Westerns. Gunsmoke, Maverick, The Rifleman, those were all staples, must watch shows at our house. Remember the rifleman? Who remembers Chuck Connors as a rifleman? I never understood going against him in a gunfight because he had his rifle pointed at you and cocked while you were still holstered. And it seemed like you didn't, he could have done that when he was 80 years old, you know, just, but 
lots of shoot 'em up stuff went on uh, back on TV in those days. Now, one week, the network had been advertising a Western movie starring Lee Marvin and Clint Eastwood. Lots of potential for shoot 'em up there for sure. Plus, it was partly filmed right in our neck of the woods in Big Bear Lake, California, and in the San Bernardino National Forest. Our entire family settled around the TV set to watch this. I'll never forget my dad's disgusted reaction when he realized Paint Your Wagon was a three-hour movie musical. <laughs> let's, let's just say that Lee Marvin's singing wasn't at all what he was looking forward to. I don't know what we watched instead of that, but we heard a lot about it. Now, chapter 5 of Judges, it's a musical. So if you don't like musicals, you're in trouble. It was composed to commemorate the events of chapter 4, which chronicled a miraculous Israeli victory. Unarmed, 10,000 Israelites defeated the 900 iron chariots of Commander Sisera's Canaanite army, as well as multitudes of heavily armed infantry. And so we pick up the story, or actually the song, in verse 1, Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Obinoam, sang on that day. In chapter 4, Deborah received a prophecy from the Lord to send Barak, with 10,000 Israelites from the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali to challenge Sisera. Barak agreed, but he added one condition, that Deborah accompany them. She agreed, and they set out. The strategy the Lord chose to employ that day was to have his people merely stand on level ground, unarmed, as the chariots and infantry bore down on them. Verse 2 says, when leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves or sacrifice themselves, bless the Lord. As I mentioned, the emphasis in these opening verses or lyrics is on the proper functioning of Israel as a larger congregation. Leaders should lead, the people should follow sacrificially. When that occurs, the Lord is blessed. We'll see in a moment that more than two tribes were involved in this victory. And so this kind of sets the tone for where Deborah and Barak want to go. They want us to know that this was a victory for all of Israel. When you get saved, you become part of something much greater than yourself. It's called, you're called, the church. It's described by several popular metaphors, but each stresses that you are a connected part of some greater whole. The church is called the body of Jesus, in which he is the head, and we are the members of his spiritual body on earth, the same way your physical body has its connected members. The church is called a building, in which each of you is a living stone made to fit together with other living stones. And the church is called the household of faith, in which each of us has our own function and service for the proper running of the household. Any thought you might not be a vital, connected member of a local church is foreign to the writers of the New Testament. So you're here. It's not a problem for you. Uh, I, you know, I'd be preaching to the choir if I started in on you. But you know people. You know Christians. They're, so, they're good Christians. They love the Lord. But they just find no need to go to church. They, they're not a member of any local church. They're just out there as part of the universal body of Christ. This is something unknown to the writers of the New Testament. They, they would not be even able to fathom a person that was not a member of the body or the building or the household. It'd be like coming to church today and leaving your hand at home. I hope I didn't offend any amputees, but, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. I mean, you, you can't do that. And that's how foreign it is. You, you can't be dismembered. And so anybody that you know that isn't a regular church member, either here or some other local fellowship, they are dismembered. Or they're in a pile of rocks somewhere when the, the building is over here. And so it's just part and parcel of being a Christian. And so emphasis here on the greater whole. And so verse 3, Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Israel had no king. Deborah wanted this song to also be performed among the Canaanites as an ode to Israel's victory to remind them that Israel's God was alive while their so-called gods were man-made objects. And so, in addition to singing about this to Israel and for Israel, this was intended as propaganda to go out into Canaanite territory to commemorate this astonishing victory. Verse 4, Lord, when you uh, went out from Sire, when you marched from the field of Edom, 
The earth trembled and the heavens poured and the clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. As we saw last week, to defeat Sisera, the Lord sent a freak thunderstorm, overflowing the river, rendering the chariots a liability and discomfiting the rest of the infantry. Seir and Edom refer back in Israel's national history to God's awesome appearance at Mount Sinai, where the covenant with Israel was established, accompanied by a thunderstorm and an earthquake. And so this is a lyrical way of, of seeing the consistency of God in employing powerful forces of nature when necessary in order to help his people. In verse 6, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Uh, we met Shamgar earlier. God raised him up as a hero. It was recorded that he killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. That's earned him the nickname Sham Wow. Actually, someone texted me that first service. That's not original, but I've stolen it now. Remember the ShamWow? It was some chamois product, right? That you, you know you could wash your car with a drop of, of water and get it completely clean with the chamois. But anyway, sp uh, speaking of Shamgar, here we learn he was a contemporary of Deborah and Barak, but he patrolled another part of the promised land. His enemy was Philistine. Theirs were Canaanite. Jael was not a judge, probably not even Jewish, but that didn't prevent her from being used by God, as we'll see. It was a dangerous time for Israelites. You couldn't count on Shamgar showing up when you were traveling or when your village was being raided. He was one man. He could only be in one place at a time. And when he was there, he took his ox goat and he dispatched the Philistines, but it was kind of local, and you really couldn't count on it. And you certainly couldn't count on a non-Israelite like J.L. to come to your aid. And so it was a very dangerous time, even though God had raised up a hero. But when God called Deborah, a much greater deliverance was realized. As we saw in chapter 4, it continued to grow and spread throughout the promised land. A mother arose in Israel is usually said to refer to the fact that the men were cowering in fear, so God raised up a woman almost to shame the men. That's possible, but I think it's intended as a contrast to something we're going to read at the end of this song where we're introduced to Sisera's mother. We'll get to it and you'll see what I'm talking about. And so if you're reading along, you find an unusual phrase like this, like arose a mother in Israel, rather than camp out on it, read the rest of the chapter, see if it ties into anything else, and it does. It ties into another mother, and so what's really intended here is a comparison. When we get there, you'll think it's fantastic. Uh, it says in verse 8, they chose new gods, talking about Israel. Then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. The Israels embraced Canaanite life and its religion. God gave them over to it, and it wasn't long before they were subjugated and enslaved. And it wasn't long before their 40,000-man army was disarmed so that they couldn't rise up against the Canaanites. Christians can become disarmed. When we, for example, doubt the power of prayer, when we doubt the truth of God's Word, when we doubt the assurance of our salvation, all those things, we, we have those doubts. I'm not saying we're perfect and never doubt. When we have those doubts, we are laying down the only spiritual weapons we have and thereby become easy prey for the enemy. And so I understand you're in a terrible trial that's going on and on and on. It seems like prayer doesn't work. It seems like God's word is not really ringing true. You start to wonder if you're even a Christian. But if you lay those things down, those are your only weapons and you're surrendering. You need to hold on to those things because they are powerful to the pulling down of enemy strongholds. And so just remember that. Stay armed. You don't want to become a disarmed Christian. Verse 9, My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Hold this thought for a few verses and Deborah will explain what she means about the rulers. Verse 10, Speak, you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire and who walk along the road. 
Far from the noise of the archers among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Remember, they couldn't travel much because of the enemy. Uh, they didn't sit in the gates judging on a daily basis because it was dangerous in the villages. And so Deborah is anticipating a time when life returns to normal. The roads would be safe. The merchants on their donkeys would go from well to well trading their goods. The regular judges who heard cases would be in the gates. She says it's at those public gatherings that this song ought to be sung, commemorating the great victory that day. It's sort of like singing the national anthem before sporting events. She said, hey, when you start normal daily village life again, this would be a great song to sing every day to remind you of the victory of God. Verse 12, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. This is a poetic, lyrical summary of the prophecy Deborah received and then delivered to Barak. As soon as the words were revealed, the victory was certain, and they could sing about it, anticipating leading away the captives of the enemy. Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. All the commentators say this is a very difficult verse to translate, and every translation I consulted gives a totally different slant on what is being said. The one that makes sense in context is from Young's literal translation of the Bible, and it reads like this. Then him who is left of the honorable ones, God caused to rule the people of Jehovah, and he caused me to rule among the mighty. In other words, after the battle was won, God restored honorable leaders to rule his people, and he continued to use Deborah even though male leadership was reestablished. And so that's a simple, straightforward reading of it. Uh, and it ties in with what she just said about the villages and all that. And so they defeated Commander Sisera and his armies. Uh, and in chapter 4, it said their victory continued to expand. And so little by little, uh, village life was restored. Judges sat again in the gates. Men were restored to leadership. But God continued to use Deborah as well. She didn't go back to being a housewife at that time. She continued to be a prophetess and uh, help out. In verse 14, from Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek, after you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Machir, rulers came down, and from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As Issachar, so was Barak sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of heart. Now, chapter 4 specified that 10,000 men exclusively from the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali were involved in the battle. These two verses make it sound like troops from six other tribes join them. And so is this a contradiction or how are we to understand this? Well, once again, a better translation will help sort this out. In the New International Version, these verses read like this. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Machir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley. And so it appears that Deborah sings that they, these other tribes sent their leaders, not their troops. She calls them captains and commanders and princes. Remember in verse 9, I told you to hold a thought where she referred to them as rulers. And so it would appear that these leaders of the other tribes were summoned to observe the battle to be able to report back the victory to their tribes as a tool towards patriotic reuniting of Israel as one nation under God. Look at them as embedded leaders. You know how they embed reporters now uh, in, uh, with uh, the troops that are out at war? You saw this a lot in the Gulf War and all of that. And so these guys are embedded leaders. God called them to come, not their troops, just the leaders, to go out and witness the battle or be a part of the battle so that they could go back and report what God had done to their own people. Four tribes are going to be singled out for not coming. Verse 16, why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear pipings for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore, 
and stayed by his inlets. And so the leaders of the tribes of Reuben and Gilead, Dan and Asher, refused to come. The leaders of Reuben uh, used an excuse that after great searching of heart, they simply couldn't leave their flocks. Gilead is a reference to the tribe of Gad. They settled outside the promised land. No reason is given. They just simply ignored the call. The leaders of Dan were busy trading and doing business. And the leaders of Asher were at Club Med. They were along the seashore and just thought they're going to hang out there. Now, it'd be good to look at each excuse and ask ourselves if we are saying no to the Lord for similar reasons or for any reason. This would be a good devotion for us personally to pursue. For example, the leaders of Reuben, uh, they, they, after great searching of heart, decided they couldn't leave their flocks. Well, the other leaders left their flocks, and of course it's possible to leave your flocks. But what you see here is this searching of heart. They convinced themselves that they gave it a real spiritual go. They, they really prayed about it. They really thought about it, and they just couldn't see their way to serve the Lord. But the problem is, this wasn't something to pray about. The call went out to come. The leaders were to come. Not to pray about coming, or it wasn't a volunteer situation. It wasn't, hey, if you'd like to come, if you don't have anything better to do, we're going to go out against the army of Sisera unarmed, at the prophecy of God. Maybe if you've got a few minutes in the afternoon, you could squeeze that in. No, they were called to come, and they said, nah, we're going to pray about it, and it just doesn't work out for us. You know, I don't, I don't want to shock you, but there are things you don't need to pray about because you know that they're right. And a lot of times Christians will make excuses like that. They'll say, well, I'll, I'll pray about it. Well, maybe you will, but it doesn't matter if you will because you've already blown it because you should just be doing it. It's not something you need to pray about. So good devotions here for all of us to stay on track. Four tribes are not mentioned at all. Judah, Simeon, Manasseh, and Levi. We, we don't know why. We're not told, so let's not speculate. But that does bring us back to the troops who went out onto the field of battle in verse 18. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. Now, I found this interesting and a cause for us to pause for a minute. If the victory was certain and it was according to prophecy, then in what sense were these guys jeopardizing their lives to the point of death? Well, they were risking life and limb in the sense that the original prophecy said that God would deliver the enemy into their hand, but it did not specify there would be no danger. Sometimes we're delivered from trouble. Other times we're delivered through trouble. I am victorious when and if God heals me. I am victorious if God chooses to not heal me because I will find ultimate healing. Better example, Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith chapter, first part of it, bunch of heroes who did incredible things like Daniel thrown into the lion's den. It says he stopped the mouth of lions. Hungry, ravenous lions looked at him and said, we'll wait for some Persian meat tomorrow. They were Persian cats, get it? Yeah. That's never funny, but I have to do it. It's something, it's, it's part of the pastor's uh, creed. Anyway, he stopped the mouths of lions, and, and, when, and he was miraculously saved. Ha later on in the chapter, you read about guys being cut in half. Uh, they believe that Isaiah, for example, was sawn in two. And so you think, well, wait a minute. How was that a victory? But it was. They were all just as victorious men and women of faith. It's just that God delivered some from their trouble and some through their trouble. And, and um, same thing with these guys. They're jeopardizing their life by obeying the Lord. It says in verse 19, Then kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. Kings, plural, indicates that other Canaanites joined Sisera against the Israelites, hoping to take spoil from them as in times past. The more you hear about this battle, the more hopeless it seemed for Israel. Not only did they face Sisera, his 900 chariots, and his infantry, but other people piled on as well and sent their armies, hoping to defeat Israel once and for all and take whatever they wanted. Verse 20, they fought from the heavens. The stars fell from their courses. Or, excuse me, the stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. 
The heavens and the stars is Deborah's lyrical way of describing a freak thunderstorm. In other words, the deliverance came from the sky. Simultaneously, Kishon flooded and overflowed. I love that scene in The Fellowship of the Ring where the Nazgul attempt to cross the fords of Bruinen and they're swept away by a sudden supernatural torrent of water. It reads even better than it looks on screen, even though it's fantastic in the film. That's what happened to uh, the armies of Sisera, at least a large portion of them. Then the horse's hooves pounded, the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Some of the chariots were swept away, others were mired, some retreated and were chased, it would seem from chapter 4, by Israelites who acquired the weapons being left behind by the Canaanites in defeat and in retreat. These guys wanted to get out of there. As I said last week, they, they understood this was a divine intervention. They were throwing off their armor and laying down their weapons to be able to run a whole lot faster to get out of that place. The Israelites came behind them, picked up their weapons, and were just uh, wiping them out. Verse 23, Curse morose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Morose was a city in the territory of Naphtali. For unspecified reasons, the men there refused to go to battle. Of interest to us is that the angel of the Lord makes an appearance here. We saw in a previous study, this is an appearance of Jesus, the second person of the triune God, prior to his incarnation in the New Testament. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. And all of a sudden, he's involved in this battle. And so we don't know if he came on the scene and if that's what also discomfited the soldiers. I mean, when you see the captain of the Lord's host, the angel of the Lord and his power and glory, I mean, that's got to be disheartening to say the least. But it's interesting. And, and these were interesting times, were they not? They mentioned that the angel of the Lord was there as if it was commonplace. Uh, it'd be like us going out today to lunch at Figaro's and saying, oh, yeah, that was cool when Jesus came in and, and you know, helped take the offering or whatever. Or when Pastor Gene sat down and let Jesus do the message. And people said, what? Yeah, yeah, Jesus was at church today. The angel of the Lord just shows up. And, and, and it, then you get to thinking, how dense are these people that the angel of the Lord hang, seemed to be hanging out at Gibeon and he showed up all the time in the book of Judges and they still turned their back on God and went after the Canaanite religion and then you realize it's no dumber than the things that we do today while Jesus is watching us. So very interesting to put ourselves in this story. Time to deliver the application. Deborah had been sitting under the palm tree hearing legal matters, giving advice, interpreting the law, this had been going on for quite some time. She was already a prophetess before she received the prophecy to call upon Barak to lead Zebulun and Naphtali against Sisera. To oversimplify, we could say she was spiritual and that she was extremely busy serving the Lord in remarkable ways. If, if you were to give an evaluation of Deborah, I mean, it would be off the charts in terms of how God was using her and how she was sacrificing and how, you know, all of these things were going on around her. And yet, she indicates in her song, God came to her while she was doing all of that and he shouted to her, awake, awake, Deborah, awake. She awoke in a way that stirred Barak to arise and others to rise up with him. I love our church family. For the last almost 30 years, um, has it been 30 years? How many years? 1985 to today is how much? Is it 30? Is it how many? 32. Yeah, for the past 32 years, you guys have been our family. And so I love our church. But we need to be ready to hear the Lord shout, awake, awake, and then rise up to new missions. We're a body of many members. We're a building of living stones. We're a household of servants. And just when we think we're doing great, and we are, we need to hear the Lord. A lot of times we think, when we read this in the New Testament, sometimes we think, well, when God says awake or arise, he's talking to a backslidden, sleeping believer who needs to get stirred up. But here we see that he can say this to a vibrant, excited church fellowship and say, hey, you're doing great, but there's some other things I need you to be doing. I need you to hear me. I need you to step out in faith. And so let's be looking for those things. Now, some missions, however, they are more solo in nature. And as we turn to JL, we're going to see that as a Christian, you're called upon 
to awake and arise yourself. In addition to G and PG and PG-13 and R and NC-17 and MA, which stands for mature audiences, the major content warnings you're going to see preceding cable programming are the following. AC for adult content, AL for adult language, GL for graphic violence, MV, mild violence, V for violence, GV, already, oh, graphic language, I'm sorry. Graphic violence is GV. BN is brief nudity. N is nudity. SSC, strong sexual conduct. And R for rape. And so those are the kind of categories to tell you what to click off of when you're watching television. The finish of Deborah's song is definitely mature with graphic violence touching on strong sexual content and rape. And so it's a very grisly kind of, in fact, the whole book is probably NC-17. Uh, and, and we don't pull any punches here at the end. And so verse 24, most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Blessed is she among women in tents. Now, we're, we were introduced to this lady in chapter 4. Her husband Heber was the spy who told Sisera that Barak was advancing with an unarmed army of 10,000 men. If her husband had thrown in with the enemies of God, how is it she was blessed? Well, you're going to see in just a sec. He asked her for water. She gave milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. When his troops were discomfited, Sisera managed to escape. He fled to the tent of Heber, his trusted spy, thinking he'd find sanctuary there. You might say that it was a sanctuary tent in that time. And so he found sanctuary there, he thought. Jael offered him a hiding place, and then she shows him more hospitality than he asked for to disarm him. He says, hey, I need a place to hide. Tell anybody looking for me I'm not here. I need some water. She says, I can do better than that. Here's a lordly bowl full of cream. I mean, just who doesn't like a bowl full of... Some people say it was yogurt, but, uh, you know, some of you are yogurt fans. I'm not a big yogurt fan, especially the kind of yogurt they were eating back then. Of course, you know, maybe it was better for you, even though they all died young. But anyway, um, <laughs> whatever it was, milk, cream, yogurt, cheesecake, I don't know. It was, it was something really just that would have him thinking, I am at home at JL's. They're going to take care of me. And J.L. offered him a hiding place. She showed him hospitality. She covered him up. And then after he drank, he fell into a deep sleep. In verse 26, she stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. And I think there's a, you, it's, you can almost hear her hammering his head. This is graphic violence. Multiple poundings of the peg, cracking of his skull, gray matter starting to ooze out. Now, I'm not trying to be overly gruff. I mean, this is, this is brutal. There's no way to sugarcoat it. You've been to the, how many of you have been on the world famous Jungle Cruise at Disneyland? Right? There's that one scene where you come upon uh, the lion and the zebra, the lions and the zebra, and the captain of your boat says, oh, isn't that nice? Those lions are guarding that sleeping zebra. Well, yeah, no, they're not. They're trying to protect your kid from the horrors of the fact that they've just taken down that zebra and they're going to tear into it. And so that's sugarcoating. You don't get any of that here with JL. You get the real thing. It gets worse. Verse 27, at her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. At her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, he fell dead. He fell doesn't mean he was standing during the assault and then fell down. It's just a way of describing a soldier's death. He fell covers all manner of death, whether on your feet or lying down, awake or asleep. You say, hey, what happened to sister? You say, he fell. He fell in battle or he fell after the battle. Sank adds to the graphic violence. As she pounded the peg, the ground beneath him was soft and his skull started to sink into it, so she had to hit him harder and harder to get the peg through because it was giving way beneath him. This is crazy violent stuff. Now, I don't have time to debate the ethics of JL's choice. It was war, he was Hitler, it was hammer time, and she went for it. Now, the end of this song, surreal. 
compared to the violence we just uh, heard, you'd think this would be the climax. And then Deborah and Barak sing about Sisera's mother. So verse 28, the mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? What tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest ladies answered her, Yes, she answered herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil to every man a girl or two for Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter? Mothers make notoriously bad character witnesses for murderers. There's been a bunch of O.J. Simpson stuff back on TV the last couple of years, some specials and miniseries and stuff, and, and it reminded me of when I was watching the original trial and uh, they had O.J.'s mother on the stand and uh, talk about what a nice boy he was and, and how, you know, how, how she helped him growing up and how he cared for her and all of that. And it was just uh, completely wasted 20 or 30 minutes because no, she just, that's her little boy. And so mothers, terrible witnesses. Mama Sisera was a worse witness because she seems to be a sociopath herself. At first she comes across as normal, wondering as any mom would about her son's delay. It was unusual. His raids against unarmed men and helpless women usually didn't take that long. Her servants tried to placate her, and they agreed with her analysis. Her analysis reveals that she was anything but normal. She casually talks about her son as a plunderer and a looter. Hey, Mom, you understand those are crimes, don't you? I mean, that morning when she was giving him his breakfast, she said, Honey, what are you going to do today? Mom, I'm going out to plunder and loot. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Have a good day plundering. Plunder your heart out. I mean, these are terrible crimes. She had a thing for hand-embroidered expensive dyed garments, and her son would bring them home to her. Honey, don't forget to bring me some spoil. You know how I love those things. Well, he'd get them from the women he sexually assaulted and whom his troops raped during the robberies because that's what to every man a girl or two means. It's a kind way of saying that the Israelite women were being sexually assaulted and raped during these forays. And so verse 31, thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. Remember earlier when Deborah was called a mother in Israel, her character is now contrasted with Sisera's mother to expose the awful wickedness of Canaanite culture and religion. One of the things it's saying is that you want to be like the Canaanites, this is the kind of mothers it produces, and these are their sons, sociopaths who produce psychopaths. That's where you're headed when you worship the gods of Canaan, as opposed to Deborah, whom God used in remarkable ways to deliver his people. So the land had rest 40 years. Deborah the musical had a 40-year run. The song of Deborah topped the charts for four decades. Something here for us to notice is that Jael acted alone. She wasn't part of Israel, and while I say she was coming to her husband's aid by changing sides so he wouldn't be killed as collateral damage, she didn't consult her husband. This was just her hearing from the Lord, you might say. An opportunity to serve the God of Israel fell into her lap, almost literally, and she arose to the occasion. It was her personal wake-up call. I don't know what Jael expected was gonna happen that day, probably that Sisera and his armies would crush the Israelites. But when she heard what happened in the battle and when Sisera came to her tent, it was an opportunity for her to do something right. And she did it. You're part of the body. You're the building. You're the household of faith. But you are mostly out in the world on your own. Ask the Lord for opportunities to fall into your lap and then serve him. When one presents itself, rise to it. Don't be like those tribes who refused. Stand as one who is called upon to, if necessary, jeopardize your life to the death. Uh, that sounds harsh. Maybe if we hear Jesus say it, we'll understand what I mean. Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will what? Lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And so as a Christian, you know somewhere in your spirit 
that you're out there every day seeking to lose your life. You're jeopardizing your life on some level in order to serve the Lord. And you're happy to do it because he's the Lord who died for you and then rose from the dead. Deborah and Barak saying, when people willingly offer themselves. You know, that reminded me of Romans 12, 1, where we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And so nothing is happening here that we don't, do every day. Go out knowing that our life is to be a sacrifice and that we are to live sacrificially in order to be a tool in the Lord's hands. And so awake, arise, you might have to alter your plans, A-L-T-A-R. Let's pray.